Hey everybody, welcome to the Hit or Die podcast, episode 55. Um, we've got a bulldog on the day. We've been having the bulldogs on a lot lately, but uh, yeah. we have Zach Presno, uh, former Buchanan Bear, and currently with the Fresno State Bulldogs, is having one heck of a year uh, before all this COVID happened. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a good show today. Uh, we just put out episode 54 this morning, which was uh, Tuesday the 28th, and uh, yeah, we uh, had some good stuff on there talking about best players of all time, LeBron versus Jordan. Uh, hopefully, we can get your guys' thoughts about it. I got a couple texts regarding uh, the Jordan-LeBron, mainly in favor of Jordan so far, but... We'll have That's to because our age, our age, our era, you know, you're not going to get a lot of people that are our era that are going to go with LeBron, I don't think. Well, maybe that's where, you know, Kenny, um, he's a younger guy, you know what I mean? That's kind of where he grew up, and, and like, we're no different. We, You know, we're Jordan guys and, and grew up in that time. Um. You know, the one that kind of threw me, though, is the bonds Griffey debate. Because um, I, I just started diving into it more after we recorded that, just looking up stats. And there's arguably a handful of guys, you know. And then I looked at, like, other lists, and Griffey's not even in people's top 30. And it, it, there's guys from, you know – the 1920s and 30s and and not to say they don't belong because you know Kenny was using stats and if you use stats statistically I mean Babe Ruth might be the best player to ever play the game statistically go look at him I mean Babe Ruth it was insane yeah and that's where we argue with eras because uh, I don't know if Babe Ruth does what he did back then in this era uh, but then again, like, you know, Ovi said on a couple of podcasts, that those athletes would adapt to what's going on now. Sure, sure. You know, Babe Ruth would probably lift weights and probably, you know. But you also don't – supposedly the athletes nowadays are bigger and faster and stronger, but nobody's – I mean, Pete Rose used a 36-inch bat, 37-ounce bat. Yeah. Guys don't – I mean, guys don't use that stuff anymore. Nobody uses – I mean, Chipper Jones used a 35. Yeah. You know, I I used a 34 left-handed. I used a 34 and a half right-handed. Um, nowadays, you can't even get high school kids to use a 34-inch bat. I mean, in Pro Bowl, I don't think guys are using big bats anymore. I, I, I don't know. I just it, – it goes back to eras. You can't – I mean, I just – Griffey was my guy. You know, I never said Bonds wasn't. No, you know what I mean. No, I, I think I never it, said he wasn't the best player. To me, though, I just love Griffey, and Griffey was my guy from since I can remember. You know, I wore number twenty-four. I mean, some of the best players all time wore the number twenty-four. If you think about it. Uh, you know, Griffey, Mays, Bonds, and Pittsburgh. He couldn't wear it with the Giants, but he probably would have. You know, he wasn't retired. Uh, Henderson. Uh, you know, there's just been so many people. My dad wore 24 at Fresno State, and that was another reason. But Griffey was just my guy. So, to me, he's the best player of all time, you know. Statistics – I wasn't even going off statistics. And you and I talked about statistics anyways. You know, Griffey doesn't have better stats than, than Bonds. But to no. me, he was so liked by everybody. Bonds wasn't liked by everybody, even in Pittsburgh. It wasn't like – you know, if you're going to put the face of somebody on the game, you're going to put Griffey as the face of the game. You know what I mean? I was going kind of off that as well. It was like, you know, Griffey was Griffey, dude. He, the hat backwards, the kid. He was the kid, man. He had fun. He made the game fun. So. No, and I don't disagree with I, – I guess it's how the words were used. We were texting on Sunday, all of us, uh, about the same topics. And it's just to say with ease – this guy's the best and yeah. without hesitation or to, to put terms like a hundred percent. I don't, you better be able to defend that, you know, because go look at uh, Hank Aaron's stats. Ridiculous. He could have been the best. You could, you could say Hank Aaron was the best to ever play the game. 
you could say Willie Mays. Willie Mays' stats are incredible. Um, and then the modern um, era, go look at Albert Pujols. Pool, pool well, remember we said Pete Rose. Yeah. His stats aren't quite what those guys are, but if you look at, like, again, he said how many winning games he was a part of. You know, and he, he does have a lot of records, and obviously he could hit. So – when we're over talking 42, I mean, over 4,200 hits, I think also maybe we confuse the, the, the question is best ever or best hitter, right? Best ever. Is so hard to say, but yeah. best hitter, I, I, you could say he's the best hitter of all time. You could, you could say a couple other guys are too. And that's, that's all. That's where I lie. You know, because I went back and looked at pull holes numbers and he leads bonds in some categories. Uh, 300 hitter, you know, I think more RBIs. Um, he had more hits, more hits. Uh, home runs, you know, he's about a hundred behind, but you know, and with slugging and OPS, they're, they're not too far off, but yeah, I think bonds is, it's arguable, you know, and again, I, I, the era thing, it's just up to people's opinion. You know, that's all it's, and that's all it's, So there's no sense in getting mad about it because you're not going to talk anybody out of what they, you know, Griffey's your guy. So to, yeah. you know, to argue about it, I guess is a bit ridiculous, but you know, there's a handful of guys that you could go out there and say are the best ever play. You know, a lot of, uh, Stan, the man, his numbers are pretty, pretty crazy. There's a lot of guys that have some crazy numbers, um, that you could put in that category. I guess that would be where we need to, you know, define what we're, what we're saying. Cause I don't, I'd honestly, I'd go back and listen to the show. I don't know what you guys were talking about. Were you talking about best hitter or were you guys talking about the best overall all around player? Well, me, I was talking about overall, you know, I just Griffey to me was, you know, during that time. Well, Griffey had more gold gloves. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It is what it is. I don't. Know. So it doesn't matter. No, like you said, nobody's gonna change my mind, and I'm not gonna change anybody else's mind. It was just fun to go back and forth. And uh, nor should you change your mind. I mean, that is what it is. What it is. you think that that's what's nothing wrong with that. Nope. You know, C- like, CJ will think Griffey's the best player of all time too. So <laughs> I will tell my son that. No, I don't. I don't know. I just. It was a fun. Uh, oh, it was a fun debate. Hey, are you going to look at that hat, man? Is that a Fisher's hat? Are you going to give us a little uh Oh yeah, I bought it. Yeah. Finally got it. Why don't we why don't we ask people if they know what it is and see if they'll comment? Um yeah. Well, we talked about it a little bit. I think with Paul Leffler or before his his uh interview came on. But Yeah, but people don't listen to this show, so they might not listen to that one. So some people kidding. Some people do. Yeah. We're going to jump into this. We'll get Zach Fresno, uh, Fresno State Bulldog on. Uh, so stick around for us. Welcome back to the Hit or Die podcast. Joining us today is uh, Buchanan alum and current Fresno State Bulldog, Zach Presno. Um his time in Buchanan was a perfect game, uh, underclass All-American, a member of the area code all uh, A's team, first team all track in 16 and 17, second team all state uh, in 17, uh, earned the Bear Award while at Buchanan, uh, Valley Champs in 15 and 16, and won the national championship in 16, also lettered in football. Uh, at Fresno State was all academic Mountain West, uh, 18 and 19, Played every game in 2019 with 55 starts at first base, 48 games as a freshman started, and uh, 2020 was on track to have a breakout year. Um, I'm sure Columbia was probably sad or happy to see you not on a lineup card. Uh, that was a pretty ridiculous weekend, but Zach, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Uh, we want to start right from the get-go back at Buchanan. Uh, can you talk about your time there and, and being back-to-back champions and, and then ultimately a national title? Yeah, uh, I mean, high school was the glory days, you know. Um, we were really fortunate to have a lot of good guys around us. Um, I mean, all those guys are my best friends to this day. 
Um, you know, as a matter of fact, after this, I'm going to go catch Grant Gambrell's bullpen. You know, I mean, we all have stayed together. We've all uh, been following each other. Um, and then we're all pretty fortunate to have really good coaches. I mean, Buchanan has probably the best coaches that, at least when we were there, I'm sure they still do, um, probably in the state. So, I mean, I think we were all just really lucky to have those guys around us. Uh, Jason Donald came by and coached um, while I was there for a couple years. Um, and those guys are just outstanding guys. You know, I mean, they just, they know the game. They all have such different experiences throughout their lives of what they've learned and who they've learned from. Um, I feel like all that knowledge is kind of built up and they're able to put that in us. Um, and they're also, they helped us with just raising good kids. You know what I mean? They just, they, they found a way to get good kids on the field. Um, and then we all became best friends and we played together. Um, and then also great leadership. All the guys that were seniors every year were just great leaders. And they just taught the class underneath them how to be that leader um, and how to win. Um, and so... I mean, just really going through that program, I think, shaped every kid who went through it um, to who they are today. And it's helped them out a lot in college. I mean, Coach Donald was a tough coach, um, but it only only helped us because we were able to go into college with the mindset of, you know, we're tough enough to be here. Uh, we know we're good enough to be here. Uh, we're willing to do whatever it takes to play and, and excel. So um, I have nothing but good memories from Buchanan. Um, and that, that just comes, like I said, from all the knowledge that those guys had and they were able to share with us. Um, and so it was just a good time. Rob. Winning a national title, how that, uh, you know, I mean, winning a section title is one thing, but then being, you know, the best team in the country, mm -hmm. uh, what was that What was that feeling like? I mean, it's just, it's crazy because in the moment you don't really think about it. You know, I mean, obviously you're checking the standings and everything, but it doesn't really hit home until you look back a couple years later and you realize, like, holy cow, I mean, that team was probably one of the best teams I'll ever be on for that age. Um, I mean, that and that team was just outstanding. You, you play two games a week. And you got Grant Gambro throwing on a Tuesday. And then we had Hunter Ranky throwing on a Friday. Um, and those guys were just lights out. And then we had Aruda, O'Gwin, um, gosh, Selma, Olsen, all these guys. And then all these other guys that some went to City College, some don't even play baseball anymore. But everybody just bought in. I mean, it seemed like we are on a college baseball team, the way guys bought in and they wanted to succeed and always put the team first. I mean, it was just – it wasn't selfish at all. And guys, I mean – I think a lot of guys learned from that team because now they saw what it takes. And then obviously you see Gambrell go to Oregon State um, and they won the College World Series. And I'm sure he had a lot to do with that team because he knew what it took to win a championship. Um, and that team was just outstanding. I mean, we, we lost one game, I think, um, to Clovis North. But other than that, I mean, every time we stepped on the field, all we had to do was score two or three runs because we knew those guys were going to throw six or seven innings and just be outstanding. I mean, I think Grant's ERA that year was like a .5. I mean, we've talked about it, and I think Luplo kind of said something, too, that, like, Donald's – it's just kind of the expectations. And it wasn't – it wasn't a junior class trying to follow the, the, the seniors the, the next year. It was, okay, it's, now this is, this is our turn. Right. You know I mean, and, and while legacy is important and tradition obviously is important, individually it was like, all right, now it's our turn, you know make the junior class want to be what we are you know and it just kind of it's like year after year it kind of just built this right monster no yeah absolutely it was like a legacy i mean every every class had their own little persona um because you come up together you know you play together in seventh grade then you play together in eighth grade then freshman year and i mean you come together with those guys and then you get on varsity and you have older guys you have younger guys but it's still your class um and it's obviously you want to succeed and it's not selfishness, but you want to be that class, you know. You want to be those guys that take your team to the championship. You want to be remembered. Um, you go to Buchanan, you see the baseballs in the outfield. I mean, that's that's your class, you know. Um, and so it's not so much of the other guys coming and saying, oh, well, you guys were the ones that lost it. It's not like that. But between us, we want to be the guys that won it. Um, and that's just – that's Tom Donald's competitiveness, and that's what he kind of – he teaches the kids. And, you know what I mean, it's just it's bred in you from seventh grade. It's – it's the Buchanan baseball way. Um, and I think that's what separated us a lot from the other schools. I mean, all we did, we lived and we breathed baseball. And it was an expectation to win, like you said. Um, and so it, it's just that the program that was there with Coach Donald and uh, Coach Fonts there now, it, it hasn't changed. I mean, you're showing up on the campus ready to win. Uh, and you're willing to do whatever it takes to win. It's almost like how are we going to be remembered, you know, mm -hmm. that class. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Fonce is no no joke. He's a legit guy, and 
I've heard numerous people say like if anybody took that gig, that was that was the guy they needed to to have take over that program. And right. and some guys have stayed to help on and and know the tradition. And it, you know, it's pretty awesome to see it. It's still, I mean, who knows what happened this year? They were young, um, but super talented, and mm -hmm. they had enough on the mound where I thought, man, at the end of that thing, they could have made another run. So, yeah. Uh, but back to you, you know, going into your your bio, kind of said that you were a Bulldog fan, being a Bulldog was something you dreamed of. And Chad and I were discussing earlier, you're also a pretty darn good running back. Was there opportunity for football beyond high school for you? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I committed to Fresno State my sophomore year. Um, and I'd always wanted to play baseball. I loved football, but I never even kind of explored that path um, just because I always wanted to play baseball. Football was kind of just one of those things that, it's just something it's fun to do. You know, your buddies are out there. You play your whole life. You get to run around and hit people. Um, and one of the best things about football, I think, was it, it took me away from baseball. You know, I mean, our practice field is right by the baseball field. And I remember sitting out there running suicides, watching these baseball guys hit BP on the field. I'm like, holy smokes, I can't wait to get back on the baseball field. You know, I mean, it just it, it really I think everybody should play another sport because it really makes you miss the sport you love the most. And then that way, when you do come back to baseball, you're fired up, you're ready to go, you want to be in the cage. Um, where these guys that only play baseball year-round, it's not that you get tired of it. But, you know what I mean? You have no diversity in your, your, your athleticism. You don't get to find anything else. You don't get to hear from other coaches. I mean, even the football mentality can be taken into baseball every day. Um, I think that's one of Batesville's strengths is he takes that football mentality. And Jason Donald did it too um, because you need that fire. You can't. I mean, not that all baseball players don't have fire, but you can't go out there every day and just roll through the motions and do what you do um, because that's how baseball practice can be. You can get repetitive. Uh, I mean, you hit, you throw, you take ground balls, and you go home. Or football, you show up, and coaches scream, blowing the whistles, yelling, okey drill, and everyone's lining up, and you got this dude over here that wants to freaking blow you up. Now your adrenaline gets going, and you got to take that under the baseball field. I mean, I think that really helps you show up every day expecting something different, expecting to do something more and more and more. Um, and I think football helps tremendously. I just love football, man. It, you can't take away that brotherhood from football. You, that's just something you never get in baseball, no matter what team it is. Because, um, I mean, you're going out there every day and you're putting your freaking – it seems like you're putting your life on the line at the moment, you know. Um, so that's just a brotherhood that you just – I mean, high school football is something I'll never forget. And I think a lot of high school football players would say the same thing. Yeah, and you're preparing for a new – a different opponent every week. No, I agree. Um, I, you know, there's nothing like Friday nights. It doesn't yeah. matter. You can't compare Friday night football to any kind of baseball game except probably for a Valley title game. You know what I mean? Um, just getting dressed in the locker room, listening to banging music, you know, spatting up your cleats, tape, whatever you got to do. Those are the memories that, you know, they're almost last longer than some of your baseball memories just because it was once a week, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but yeah, I agree. Football, playing football was so much fun. And like you said, that fire to play baseball, like right when you got back on the baseball field, it was like, okay, it's go time. There was no time to get burnt out. Like some of these kids, they, they still love the game. Don't get me wrong. And they still want to play it hard and all that, but you get burnt out going, you know, nine, 12 months out of the year. Um, but yeah, playing another sports, it's, it's great for athleticism, like you said, and then to, to keep that fire burning for the sport that you love more. Right. Um, and so you get on at Fresno State. What was the initial adjustment like for you as far as weight room and academics and not even the baseball side of it? Um, you know, the first thing that I really realized, and I go back to Coach Donald, was I felt like I was one of the most prepared kids there. Um, and not for the physical side of it, but for the mental side of it. Uh, I mean, a lot of these kids, I mean, one of my roommates now, they come from these small towns. And it's not that they're not good kids, but they come from these small towns where they hit 500 and they're the best players since King Tut. And then they come here, you know, and it's a wake-up call. And they, all these kids don't have these big weight rooms and these big, you know, I mean, it's walking into a whole new world. Um, it's like, uh, what do they say, the fish and the small fish in a big pond? Or, you know what I mean? That's really what it is. <laughs> so coming in, I always, I already felt prepared. I mean, Buchanan already has the weight room. Buchanan's weight room is just as nice as Fresno State's. Um, so, I mean, that kind of stuff, I felt like I was an advantage because I wasn't, it wasn't so much as the bright lights. It was, you know what I mean? It almost felt like everyday business. And I had, obviously, Ashford and Corby. I mean, these Buchanan guys. 
I mean, it literally it felt like just taking going from Buchanan to Buchanan University. That's what it feels like when you get there. And I mean, it's a huge advantage from going from Buchanan. I mean, it makes sense why so many guys want to do it because it's an easy adjustment. Um, and you show up the first day and I mean, it's intimidating. Don't get me wrong. I think my class, there was 18 new freshmen, I think maybe four Juco guys. Um, so we're half and half. I mean, half returners, half new guys. And as a returner, you never want to see the new guys, you know, I mean, it's a new clubhouse. You come, it's intimidating. The guys, they don't talk to you. You get the silent tree. Everyone looks at you like you're freaking scum. I mean, it's, it's a whole different world. Um, but it, it, it's good because it really, it humbles you, you know, it humbles everybody you show up and you're like, Holy smokes, I'm not the best player anymore. You know I mean? All these guys are bigger than me. They're stronger than me they're faster than me. Um, but it's a good adjustment that everybody needs because it shows up and makes you want to work harder. Um, and like football, I mean, it comes here and you get that fire again because now you're like, oh, you know, I need to do this better. I need to work harder to do that. Um, and I think that's what Batesville pushes for. I mean, that's why he has that mentality of you got to be better than everybody else because you show up and these returners already think they're better than everybody else. As a freshman, you have no choice. You know, either you rise to the occasion and you figure it out or you're going to get run out of the program because you just don't belong. Um, and that's one of the great reputations of Fresno State that I love. A lot of people will say, you know, I, I didn't like Fresno State, so I left. And I, get, I mean, everybody has their thing that they do, and it's your life, go live it. But in my opinion, if you're not a fan of Fresno State, it's because you're not a fan of the football mentality. You're not a fan of having a fire in your belly and not being the best player on the field, but wanting to work towards being the best player on the field. Um, I mean, there's a lot of guys on the team that showed up freshman year that probably didn't think they were going to play a lot, and now they're everyday starters. And then there's those guys that showed up and thought they were going to be a starter right off the bench, and they didn't play, you know. Um, and so it's just a humbling experience for everybody to show up and kind of come to reality a little bit and want to play harder and practice harder. Um, and a lot of guys make huge transformations. I mean, it's just crazy to see guys from freshman year to junior year, whether it's physically or mentally. Yeah, so just no, you know, it's no shock, too, that he's recruited a lot from Buchanan, you know, mm -hmm. uh, those guys, and they've all done well. Yeah. You know, look at the Arudas, yourself, and, you know, his kids. Um, well, I think there's a, a similarity, like Zach's talking about, and I think that's why Bates all takes the Buchanan guys, because he knows that how hard they worked at Buchanan and that mentality at Buchanan that they can come in to Fresno State and fit in right away and not have to try to build that mentality in like some of the other freshmen from, you know, or the other high schools around here. So I think that he's just comfortable, but it's not that he's just comfortable. He gets the, you know, the best of the best. And there's a reason why they go right in and they play. Mm -hmm. It's funny. So, cause Batesel, he's still to this day, he always says the same joke, you know, somebody will screw something up at practice. And you say, I can walk over to Buchanan right now and grab anybody I want. And he'll be able to do that. Um, and so it's funny. I mean, he just he's always talking about Buchanan and stuff. And it's a joke. And a lot of guys get tired of it if you're not from Buchanan. Um, but it comes back to that, like you say, exactly. If uh, you guys were going back at it tomorrow and you had some freshmen coming in, what would be the first thing you would tell these young kids coming into Fresno State? Um. You no, know, probably going back to what I said, you just can't – you can't get intimidated. It's good to be intimidated at first because, like I said, you get that fire to want to work harder, but you can't shy away. You can't be the kid in the corner that doesn't want to say anything, doesn't want to do anything, just kind of wants to sneak behind and go with the flow. You have to stand out. I mean, that's the only way you can do things. Uh, I mean, some guys will call it eyewash, call it what you want. Sometimes you got to be that guy. You know, there's 36 players and there's one head coach. There's one guy that writes the lineup. So if you want to be that guy that's going to play and he's going to strike the attention, you got to go above and beyond. You have to do the extra stuff. You have to show up two hours early and you got to hit. And you got to stay an hour after and you got to hit. If you screw up, you can't pout about it. You can't walk behind the cage. You know, you got to do your thing. You show up. You have to act like a senior. You can't act like a freshman because you're just going to get eaten up. You have to show up and think that you deserve to be on the field. Um, and that's the confidence that it takes in college baseball. Everybody thinks they're better than everybody, you know. I mean, baseball is one of those sports where confidence is a huge factor. And so if you show up without that confidence, I mean, you're going to get eaten up right away. Um, and your confidence is only going to go down from there. You know, have, you got to have that high confidence and let the older guys come up to you and break it down a little bit because that's what they're supposed to do. But it doesn't mean that you got to come in and shy away. you got to come in and be confident want to be that guy and want to show everybody 
that you're going to be that guy. Um, and that's – we our freshman class was outstanding at that. I and mean, we have some guys – you show up, a lot of older guys aren't going to like you, you know, because you have that mentality. But that's what it takes because six months later when you're in the game and you're throwing relief on a Saturday, they're not going to think, oh, shoot, here we go. Here's Johnny, you know, this kid's he's going to get nervous. No, they're going to say, okay, well, yeah, this kid annoys the crap out of me, but he's going to go up there and he's the best player on the mound and he's going to throw his heart out. And so I think that's the biggest advice you give a freshman. Yeah. Welcome, welcome of the challenges and welcome the adversity and mm-hmm. embrace those moments. What they say, like, learn to get comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Yeah. You know, and then last year, you know, you guys were pretty, I mean, you were uh, an older club. Uh, can you talk about playing in that Stanford regional and kind of that experience and what, you know, you, you took from that club and that year and the experience into this year with these younger kids? Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, that was – that was something that I'll never forget. I mean, that was the most fun baseball experience of my life by far. I mean, I don't know if you guys went, but I mean, I think Fresno State had more fans there than any other team combined. I mean, just an absolute experience. They're all – so I look up and see my sister in the stands doing red wave chants, and I mean, it was just hilarious. And I mean, all those guys there on our team, they showed up and they were just ready to go. Um, I mean, we took in and out the day before, and it was probably the worst in and out I've seen from our team. You know, we got these other teams watching us, and we're like, holy cow, these guys think we suck. You know, we're freaking bobbling ground balls, and nobody even blinked, like, blinked an eye. You know, they didn't care. Like, you know what, we're going to show up, we're going to do our thing, um, we're going to go after it. We showed up that first day. Our first five guys got on base, seemed like every single at bat, and they kept doing the same thing. I mean, we think we had bases loaded. Um, I think we hit through the lineup almost. I mean, it's just – it was outstanding. Jensen on the mound throwing 100 with all the confidence in the world that he's going to throw a freaking nine-inning shutout. Um, I mean, that was just something else. Bates, though, I don't even think said a word. He just sat in the corner and watched <laughs> because he didn't have to. You know, I mean, he, he had those older guys. He had Ashford, McCarthy. I mean, at that point, you're so far in the season, what is he going to say? So he just sits back, he does his signs, and he just watches. And that's that's how you know your team did something right. Um, and that's where we were at. And that was just, I mean, we were just along for the ride. The younger guys that were at the bottom of the lineup, I mean, you just, all you had to do was your job because you knew that those top four or five, six guys were always going to do their job. And if they didn't do it, the next step that they were going to. Um, and being a younger guy, we all saw that. We all saw what it took to get to that point in the season. Um, I mean, those guys, I could go on and on about every single older guy on that team, Ashford, McCarthy, Dempsey, um, I mean, they all came from different backgrounds, different types of players. Um, I mean, Dempsey's one of my favorite stories. Um, and I can talk forever, but short story about him. I mean, he came in his first year as a transfer, and I think he struck out every single at bat in the fall. You know, we were all sitting there like, who the hell is this kid? Like, what, where did this guy come from? And so we go into the spring, and he wasn't playing at first. And I would sit next to him. we just kind of talk baseball, hang out. And a lot of guys didn't think he was going to get a lot of chances. One day he gets a chance, he hits a home run, he's hitting ninth, starts the next day, does pretty good, starts the next day, hits another home run. Next thing you know, he's hitting second by the end of the year, and he's hitting 340 with four home runs. And you come back the next year, the guy played probably half the season, and now he's already a leader on our team because he has that confidence. And now he's like a four-year veteran. Um, and that just showed all our guys that it doesn't matter where you come from, what you do in the fall, although it's going to help, it matters what you do in the spring. Um, and so all those different leaders come from different backgrounds and different stories. I think it's just all I mean, we just took it all in. It was just free knowledge. Um, and then going into this year, I mean, that's what we did. We we wanted to be those guys. It doesn't mean you had to play like them, but you needed to have the mentality like them. Right. That recipe, you guys saw what it, you know, the pieces it took to get there with, with mentality, with effort. And I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that says a lot about somebody that could very easily just mentally gone in the tank you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, I think he hit a bomb in the regional too, right? I think he mm-hmm. went out there. Yeah. Uh, that's a pretty, that is a great story, man. And, and we talked to Stanford's uh, head coach, uh, Esker, and, and pitching coach Eager, and they were super complimentary about your guys' team. And, you know, the one thing they said is that first night, Jensen looked like a big leaguer uh, right out the gate. And when you guys knocked him off game one, they challenged their team. I mean, it was – it's D1 baseball. Anything can happen just because you're Stanford means nothing. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, it's 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 how you represent the name on the chest. And I think uh, you said if you if you guys wait too long, Fresno State's going to knock you in the mouth. Mm-hmm. And I think you like said that. something to that effect. Like they did punch you guys yeah. in the mouth. You did punch them in the yeah. mouth. It was just how they were going to respond. Right. You know, and the other thing too, I was going to mention, and I skipped over it, was you come and you were recruited as a. I mean, were you recruited as a catcher? Yeah, that what the what the intent was to catch, and then you're you know last year you the majority of the season first base. Talk about you know it, that adjustment. Did you did you play much first base in high school? I mean, you were mainly a catcher, right? I mean, it was yeah. No, I didn't play. Deep. I don't think I've played anything but catcher since seventh grade. <laughs> I mean, it was a huge we. Gosh, what was this? So that was sophomore year, and Carter was obviously going to be our catcher. You know, he's one of the best catchers I've seen. Um, and there was no question about it. No, I didn't. It showed up there, and obviously you want to beat him out, but I knew he was our guy, and he was a good leader, and he had been there. And so one day we show up, and first base wasn't working out too well, and I think it was the middle of fall, and Bates goes, you know what, we're having first base tryouts today. So anybody who wants to go over there, grab a glove, and let's go. So I think there was like seven of us. I mean, guys from everywhere, outfield, everything. And we go over there, and we're taking ground balls on our knees. Jermaine Clark is hitting his ground balls, and, the next day we show up and he's the list, and now we're down to six. And then the next day we're down to five. And soon enough, I think there was like two of us left over there, and we were first baseman all of a sudden. You know, I don't even think I did anything with catching. It was I mean, within two weeks I went from being a full-blown catcher to a full-blown first baseman. And that's all we did. I mean, we had infielders camp. Um, and we would, I mean, ground ball 24, rapid fire, and I'd be there by myself taking ground balls, and I would – botch a ball and Bates be yelling at me like I've been playing first base my whole life. I mean, just crazy stuff. I mean, I'd be drenched in sweat because I got to catch these or these balls and then I got to run up and field a bun, throw it to third. And by the time I throw it, Pat Ware is already freaking hitting another ground ball and I got to sprint back. And I mean, just crazy. You know I mean? I, I learned to hate first base by the end of the fall because I was like, this is terrible. I want to go sit behind home plate and squat and catch a ball. Um, and so, but no, I mean, it was a huge adjustment. But that's just – I mean, Coach Clark, um, sadly he left. But between him and Batesel, those guys are some of the best infield coaches um, that you'll find. And so they just – they helped me out right away. Any question I had, they would answer it. If I want to show up earlier, stay late, they'd hit me ground balls all night. Um, I mean, Coach Clark had a family with two kids. Um, and obviously family came first. But he would do whatever it took to make sure that I was comfortable at first base. If that meant staying until 9 o'clock at night. Um, and so that, that just helped me. And then just showing up there, I think the guys, once the season started rolling, guys understood that I was new there. And nobody really held it against me. You know, I mean, they knew that I was going to go out there and do my best. If I messed the ball up, they weren't – no one was going to yell at me. No one was going to say anything. Um, they would just – they pull me aside, tell me what I did wrong, and move on to the next play. Um, and so it was, a, it was a pretty easy transformation once the season started. Um, and then personally, I mean, gosh, going from – wearing gear and getting all sweaty and sitting back there and blocking balls to be able to stand there for three innings and maybe get a ground ball or catch one or two. I mean, it is just a, a huge adjustment. So, but it was a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot, a lot of fun to see the game from a different perspective. Definitely. Um, I mean, right. I like, what? last help the legs last a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it was a blast, man. I could go on and on. So into this year, you caught a lot more games this year. Uh, it mm-hmm. seems like you were the guy. I think you, kind of platoon a little bit. You just, you know, think Arizona State, you caught the first two, went to first base. Um, but for the most part, you caught the majority of innings. Um, so what was that like getting back behind the dish? Right. No, that was, that was the best part because you get away from something that you've loved for so long and you come back, it's like you're starting new. You know, I mean, you show up and you, you, you love it again. You love getting all sweaty. You love putting on that dirty gear. You know what I mean? It's like you leave something for so long, you come back to it and you can't wait to do it again. Um, and especially being able to catch all those pitchers from my class, that was really cool um, to see how much they've gained and, and everything. I mean, it, it was really cool to catch Jaime and all those guys taking a year off because, gosh, did those guys get better. I and mean, just outstanding differences from freshman year to junior year. Um, but, yeah, I loved every second of that. That was a blast. Roth, you want to get into the – about the offense? Since he's the, yeah. hit, the hitting guru. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, no, but this year, you know, it was a lot of fun. I was, I'd go out there. I went to some of your practices and watching you guys do your thing and watching Batesall and how he, 
coaches, the hitters, and and your guys' plans. Um, it was just so neat for me to uh, learn some of that stuff and watch it. Uh, getting into your season this year, you you know you were on pace to you know obviously have a career uh, year for yourself, um, but the team was was getting comfortable and and having good offensive numbers. And uh, let's just get into you know you guys and your hitting and what you guys try to focus on, and especially for you, I know you don't really want to talk about yourself, but. Um, you know, what kind of year you were having and how comfortable you were up the plate. I mean, it seemed like, you know, they always say it looks like a beach ball. I think that it's fair to say that you were um, hitting up some beach balls up there and um, just for this, this, this to happen to us and end the season, it's just kind of, it's got to hurt you a little bit more uh, with how good of a season you're having. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, the first day you show up, they preach, you hunt a fastball. And from the first day to the day you leave, you hunt a fastball, you hunt a fastball, you hunt a fastball. I mean, that's what our kind of our persona is as a team is we hit fastballs. Um, and if you can't hit a fastball, you're not going to play. And so showing up, I think that's all we do. You know, we have those machines in the outfield or in the barn. Um, and I think they're on 85 and they're fastballs. And practice starts at 2.30. Guys are showing up at 12.30. They're getting their gear on. And by 1 o'clock, they're in the cage hitting fastballs. I mean, that's all we do. We sit in there, you talk baseball, and everyone takes 10 swings, you rotate. By the time practice starts, you've already taken 100 swings, you know. Um, I'm not sure how, how many other programs do that. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of become a thing where if practice starts at a certain time, everybody shows up two hours before. And I remember when I first got there, I showed up, I think, 30 minutes before because I'm out of high school, and everybody's already in the cage ready to go. And, you know what I mean, they're freshmen. Like, what the hell is going on around here? Um, and that's just, that's what you do. And it, that's just, that's awesome. I mean, it, Bates will preach his hitting. Obviously he loves defense. I mean, I think we take 18 ground balls a day and that's not a lot of ground balls. And for about three hours of the practice, we're hitting. And in outfielders, all they do is hit. I mean, we'll be taking ground balls and outfielder would be coming out here. Like, hey coach, like, what are we doing? He goes, you go learn how to hit doubles. And they go to the freaking, they go to the barn and they hit. He says, that's what you said. You want to play? You go hit doubles. Um, and so, I mean, it's it's not even – before we even get to the approach and, and the, uh, the mechanic side of it, it's just repetition. I mean, I, I could strongly say that I'd be surprised if any team hits more than us in the country because, um, I mean, those guys, they just live in the barn. Um, and then you can go there at 9 o'clock at night because we all live at Bulldog Village and they will, guys will walk across and go blast music and hit for another hour. Um, and so I think that's one of our biggest strengths is just going in there and swinging all day long i mean that's all guys do um and so yeah i mean that's just that's what bates preaches you know it's just you go up there and you bang and you hit fastballs but um i don't know i mean as far as approach goes there's baseballs i mean bates is a very complex guy when it comes to hitting i mean it's i mean i'm sure you heard him talk about triangle and stuff when you were back behind the cage did you hear that kind of stuff uh no not he didn't get into that when yeah, I was back yeah I mean, he, he preaches triangle and it's too hard to explain right now i mean it's a simple concept but it's it's pretty much whether you he says your triangles on the lights so like you're hitting fly balls um stuff like that so you want your triangle on the crossbar of the l screen um and that's what you should be aiming for he, he always said how loop low every swing he took in batting practice he would always keep his barrel under the crossbar um and that's where you start in BP. And so if you're in the cage and you're hitting off the tee, you're going to want to hit the ball at the bottom of the net because it's a ground ball. And ground balls in the cage turn into line drives in BP, and line drives in BP turn into doubles and home runs in the game. And he's always lived by that. Um, and so now you get a lot of those guys with the launch angle and they're hitting balls off the top of the net. Um, and, you know, it's just not helping you. The ball's staying still. In the game, you're going to be swinging underneath every single one. Um, and so I think that's what's contributes. Our guys' barrels are in the zone for such a long time because we have such level swings. And although we might hit a lot of ground balls, we're playing Division One baseball. I mean, shoot, you saw our field. You're going to get more bad hops than you're going to get good hops. And then you might have an 18-year-old kid that's nervous in the bright lights that has to feel the ground ball on a Friday night. You know, I mean, your odds are a lot higher than if you're hitting fly balls in D1 baseball. Um, and so that's just the first part of our approach is you just go up there and you bang and you hit ground balls and hit line drives. Um, and then you saw, I mean, that turns into home runs. Our nine hitter was hitting home runs on opening night. Um, I mean, I think we're leading the country in home runs at one point. 
And no one's going up there trying to hit home runs over the scoreboard, but that's just what the swing transforms into. Um, and that just comes back to the repetition too. It's nice to hear. I mean, here's a Division One baseball player that's hitting for power, driving in runs, has a high batting average, and he's concentrated on hitting hard ground balls in the cage, line drives on the field, and then they're going to turn into, you know, line drives in the gap and home runs. And, you know, watching you hit, your swing, you don't have an uppercut. You know, people might think that, you know, you had seven bombs on the year and you have you have a little uppercut, but your swing's level. And like you were saying, in the game, you're just going to dip that just a little bit more just because you're going, you know, a higher percentage of your swing. And it's going to turn into that, the ball getting driven. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's good to hear. And I'm, you know, I hope some of the guys out there listening to this can, can see that it's coming from you. And we didn't tell you what to say. And, uh, you know, that launch angle thing is a, it's there. It's always been there, but you know, you can't teach launch angle. You can mm -hmm. teach, you can teach, you know, being on plane and hitting hard, hitting hard balls, whether it be exactly. ground balls, line drives, just hit the ball hard mm -hmm. and it'll work out. That's some good stuff, man. You know, it's worked. So why, why change your approach exactly. uh, to something that you're just not used to doing or, or something that doesn't work for you, you know, uh, the other upside, uh, if there is an upside, and I think Chad, we've talked about it before for 2020 is while the season may be over, uh, it ended, uh, with you hitting a walk off bomb. So, uh, you, you, you want to take us through that potentially your final AB? Yeah, uh, I mean, well, it started. Let's start at the beginning of the game. Um, our team was. Well, yeah, you, were, you Before you go, yeah, I'm going to call you out. Sorry. Yeah, I, I you, knew it was coming. You're, you're 0 for 4, 0 for 4 with four punch outs, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay. And so Continue. Yeah, we'll, we'll start. We'll at the last we don't get to the strikeouts yet. <laughs> uh, but that, that's what I'm saying, is our team was hitting really well. You know, I mean, you might not. We left some guys on base, but we were winning the game. I don't remember the score, but I'm pretty sure we're winning the game for the most part. Um, and then before that game, Oscar Carvajal came up to base because he was a starter before, and he said, "Hey, coach, I think I can help the team out at closer." And so we're all fired up because he's going to close the game, and we had struggled with that. And so we're like, "Oh, we're good to go. All we got to do is get to the ninth inning." And so our team's hitting good. Um, yeah, obviously I was struggling a little bit, uh, but everything's going good. And we have Oscar in the game in the ninth. Um, I think we we're up by one or two. And, you know, I mean, we felt like we won the game. And Oscar had an off night, and that's fine. Um, and nobody got mad at him. Nobody did anything. It was his first start. But obviously, now we were put in a position where it was tied. Um, and so our first two guys, I don't remember what happened, but I know there's two outs. And so I'm coming up. And before that, you know, you think the game is over. You're over for four, four strikeouts. You're like, oh, thank God, man. Like, Oscar's in. I don't have to have a fifth strikeout. I'm good. The game's going to be over. Now I'm walking up to the plate like, holy crap, here we go. Like, I got to come up here for the fifth time. Let's see what happens. They bring in their closer, throwing 94. Um, and so I'm walking up there, and I, I, it's taken a lot of good pitches to hit throughout that bat. I think I was being too picky. I was trying to do too much. Um, I started getting a little cocky with hitting off-speed pitches because I had some success. And I think I got away from the fast, like we said, that's always been our plan. So if I'm going to get away from what I'm best at, I'm going to struggle. Um, and so I went up there and I told myself, I said, I'm swinging. No matter what happens, if I'm going to strike out, I'm just because I struck out swinging at all three strikes. I'm not going to take any pitches um, and I'm going to hunt the fastball. And so I went up there and I mean, the pitch was at my chest, but I was looking for a pitch that I wanted to hit and it was a fastball. And most of my brain, I told myself I was going to swing. Um, and then obviously, Whatever happened after that happened. Um, but like I said, that just goes back to what we talked about before. You, you get away from your plan and failure starts to happen. You know, it's not because you can't hit those pitches because I wasn't executing my plan that day. And so that fifth at bat, um, having the team pick me up every single inning before that, now going in there, I can go back to my plan and I can execute it. Um, and the pitch doesn't have to be right down the middle, as you saw. You know, you just you have to go up there looking for your pitch and let – I hand coronation do the rest. Yeah, I was gonna say it, it looked it looked up and away and yeah. Um just got some barrel did you off the end of the bat a little bit? Enough barrel to it? I think I don't know, man. It was an adrenaline rush. I was I was just happy to hit the ball. I was hoping it stayed fair. It looked like I pimped it, but I was really just sitting there praying to God it was staying fair. 
we'll, we'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I wasn't trying to call you out. I've, I've been 0 for 5 with five strikeouts. I know how it feels. And to come up thinking, you know, it's hard to, to stay within yourself. And you did that. You stayed within yourself. And, you know, your team picked you up. And, you know, you're a team leader as it is. And uh, you just went up there thinking, I got I to gotta do something. Not trying to do too much. Like you said, you are just trying to put the ball in play pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and just have a good swing on it. And, you know, you got a good pitch and you drove it. You know, one of the coolest things, too, um, there happened to be all my little brother's baseball team friends in the stands. And they watched the whole game. And they all came up to me after. And obviously you're happy, but you still struck out. You're happy you won. And they come up to you and say, hey, man, you know, that was really awesome. They said, our kids needed to see that. They all saw that you're 0 for 4 with four strikeouts. And you went up there. And you didn't let it bother you. You didn't pout. And you went up there and you did what you did. Um, Because that's stuff that we don't think about. You know, you're excited to team one, but you never realize who's in the stands and who's going to learn from that. Um, And whether that the kids really learn from or not, you never know, you know, the coaches that were in the stands, they saw that. And that, that's awesome how you take it from a different perspective and how it can benefit someone else's game. And I, that was one of the biggest things I took from that game. Um, because in my mind, you know, it's four strikeouts. But in their mind, it's how you approached after the four strikeouts. Um, so th- I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it didn't and affect just- your, your overall game. To not let one swing affect the next swing and one A-B affect the next A-B. As just mentally, that's you're you're tougher than most guys, and I think in baseball it demands that. Yeah, and it proves what kind of character you have as a player and a person, you know, or are you a team guy or a me guy, and you know, uh, picking yourself up and picking your teammates up, it, it really proves something. And not only your team see that or coach people in the stands, but you know, you're in your junior year, scouts or scouts are watching that, seeing what type of player you are when it comes into, you know, he's got four, four strikeouts. How is this fifth at bat going to dictate his game? You know, that, that type of thing. And, and that's all being, you know, a character trait. And that's what a lot of, uh, they, they look for, you know, and that's good that you have, you have great character. And I hope goes back to being prepared, man. being prepared yeah. and being in the right culture. And I can tell you just by talking with you the last half hour, you got a lot of good things coming your way, man. Um, I'm excited for you. I know we won't talk about the draft because we just don't know what's going to happen with it. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we'll see you playing professional baseball. Um, You know, if not, it's a dog's uniform or whatever the case may be. But no matter what happens, honestly, man, uh, we, we hope nothing but the best for you and success. And I thank you for doing this. Uh, you know, I know you guys are, like you said, you're going to go catch a bullpen and, and inch you to get back on the field in some way. But, uh, again, just thanks for coming on, man. It's been a, a real pleasure talking with you. Yeah, no, thank you guys, man. I had a good time. Appreciate it. Chad, yeah, good luck to you and, and everything that happens. And, uh, you know, whether it's the draft, you will get drafted, whether it's this year or next year. Um, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that we were we had a lot of fun coming out and watching you guys. Yeah, absolutely. This year. And, and we'll be back out. Especially, especially you, because you carry yourself the right way. And, you know, that goes a long way. Even for me, that's been a part of the game that I can tell my son, you know, look at the way this guy acts. And I know I'm not the only dad that does that with his kids. So uh, thank you for being, you know, the type of player you are and purpose on the field. Yeah, thank you guys. And uh, we'll be following you, man, and we'll definitely stay in touch for sure. Uh, that's uh, episode 55, Mr. Zach Presno. Hit or die.